Okay, so I'm going to take you down for a second then. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so I'm doing a gluten-free pizza bed breast today. Um, and I did have a little try doing this non-gluten-free. Um, and it didn't quite work so well. Um, I'm actually going to stop that one because I can hear myself. Um, so yeah, I did try doing a non-gluten-free version of this, but it didn't work very well just because gluten-free recipes are very specific. Um, um, so the flowers are different and things like that. Um, it behaves very differently. So you, I'll say about this when I go through the ingredients list, but um, if you just substitute the non-gluten-free flour instead, then you will still get like a pizza bread shape. Um, and Adam tells me it still tastes good. Um, it's just not like a pizza bread style. It's more like a flatbread. So you can do it and it still tastes fine. Uh, but I'm gonna stick to going through the gluten-free pizza bread recipe. Um, and it was quite a, an important thing for me just because I got diagnosed as um, with celiac disease about a month ago, which I you know, said a little bit about after the church uh, Zoom meetings. Um, and it's been a whole learning process for me to relearn how to bake and how to cook without gluten. And gluten seems to be in so many things that you don't even think of. Um, so yeah, it's been quite, quite different for me. And this is just one of the recipes that I found over the past month that actually works and doesn't taste like it's gluten free. You get that kind of odd taste sometimes, particularly in breads and things. Um, but it's also an opportunity, I guess, for me to educate people about what celiac disease is, uh, what it means for me and what kind of changes I have to make. Um, so celiac disease basically means that my body has an autoimmune response to gluten. It can't process the gluten. Um, and gluten is a protein that's found in a lot of cereals. And the main ones of those, I remember it by browse. So uh, barley, rye, oats, and wheat. So anything with those four things in, I can't eat. Um, and I actually don't have any symptoms for the disease whatsoever, uh, but it's a genetic condition. And I only got picked up with it because my cousin got diagnosed with it. Um, and it was a complete change, a blood test and then a biopsy. And then I was, I was off gluten for, for life. There's no cure for it at the moment. The only cure for it is to be completely gluten free. Um, and I have to be really careful with things like cross-contamination. So Adam and I have things like separate butter tubs, separate jars of sauces and things like that, because if he, if he, if he butters his toast and then there's a little tiny crumb of toast in the butter, then I have that, then that's going to cause uh, me, me damage essentially. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's gluten free. Um, so I hope, I hope you do like this recipe. Um, there's a couple of different ingredients in there and I'll explain what those ingredients are and why they're being substituted in for different flours and things like that. Um, I think that's all I have to say. Uh, so yeah, I'll, uh, I'll pop you back up. This is my fancy little thing. So I'll pop you up here and hopefully, hopefully that's all good. Um, um, okay, Chloe, last time you, you had it rotated, can you rotate? Yep. Yeah. How's that? Perfect. Thank you. No worries. All right. Okay. Um, so like I said, I've only been gluten-free for a month and I've only made this recipe once. So fingers crossed that it goes okay. Um, I have no blue Peter. Here's what I made earlier, which I perhaps should have done, but that's okay. Um, so I think the ingredients list was all on the web page, but to just go over all the bits and pieces that I've got. Um, so we have 245 grams of all-purpose flour, gluten-free. Um, we have one teaspoon of xanthan gum, which is this funky little yellow coloured powder here. And it comes in a little packet like this. Um, so 
gluten in normal flour can make things really elastic. It's like it binds things together. And because we don't have any of that in our normal flour, this gum, and there's a variety of different gums available that you can use, but this gum acts as that elasticity and the binding agent that you need in bread. And it also holds some of the moisture. So you don't just get lots of dry bread, which nobody wants. Um, then we need 35 grams of tapioca starch. Um, and this is what makes the crispiness of the bread. So rather than it just being a soft doughy blob, the tapioca starch helps to give it that crisper outside edge. Um, I guess these two things are, are vital. So you need the flour and you need the gum. Uh, but if you don't have the tapioca starch or you want to do gluten-free baking, but you don't want to buy all of these different ingredients, then you can take out the tapioca starch, put the 35 grams of this and do another 35 grams of flour. And rather than using three quarters of a cup of um, the, the liquid, you need one cup of liquid instead. Um, but I'm going to use it because I've got it. Um, and you need one and a half teaspoons of baking powder to help it rise, uh, a teaspoon of salt, and that's your dry ingredients. And then what you need is a tablespoon of oil, uh, one egg and one egg white. My eggs are cold at the minute, so I'm just, I've just got them in some lukewarm water to bring them up to room temperature. And then you need three quarters of a cup of milk. Uh, like I said earlier, if you don't have the tapioca starch, make that into one cup of milk and no tapioca starch, if that makes sense. Um, so, first we want to combine all of our dry ingredients. Uh, actually, no, we don't, we don't wanna do that. We wanna make our oven hot first. Um, so we want to preheat the oven to 400 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, or that's about 204 degrees Celsius, but my oven definitely isn't that accurate. So I'm going to whack it somewhere between 200 degrees, somewhere there. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're baking the pita breads, you want them to be on something really hot because you actually only cook them for about five minutes in total. So I guess it's a bit like a Yorkshire pudding and I don't know the science behind this, but where you put it in something really hot and it makes it rise, it makes it puff and cooks it really quickly. Um, so you can use an upturned baking sheet or if you've got a pizza stone or, or something like that. Um, I have this, which is my griddle pan. It usually has a, a grill thing in here. Um, but if I just upturn that, it's just a really nice flat metal plate that's gonna get really hot. So when I put my pizza breads on that, it's gonna be scorching ready for them. So I'm gonna pop that in my oven whilst it heats up. Uh, so that gets really nice and hot as well. Okay, now we can do all our dry ingredients. Okay, so we have our flour, uh, then we put in our xanthan gum in there. I'm really glad I weighed these out earlier. Um, then the tapioca starch, which is the very white powder. Make sure it's all out. Um, we need our baking powder in there like that. And a teaspoon of salt, which I'm gonna guess is about that much. Um, some things I feel like I need to weigh out very accurately and other things kind of a bit of a this and a that. Okay, I'm just gonna mix that up so that everything's incorporated all the way through. Uh, okay. I actually just like to shake things until it's all, all nice and incorporated. It's much more fun than whizzing a spoon around it. Alrighty, so that's all our dry ingredients. Put that over there. Um, the next thing we want to do is add our oil, our eggs and our milk. So all of our wet ingredients into this. Um, so I'm going to just tip away my water, move that aside. And I want one whole egg, 
and then the egg whites from another egg. I've got my little dish for that. Okay, so that's my one egg. Egg white. If you're feeling a bit risque, you can do this directly over your egg. If not, then do it in a separate bowl in case your egg yolk slops in and you want to suck it out. I've heard that you can do um, the bottle trick, have you seen that, where you hold a bottle over it, squeeze it and then suck it and it sucks the egg yolk back up. So if you accidentally get another egg yolk in there, it's all good. Um, I'm going to save that for later and put it into my scrambled eggs to make them really nice and glossy. Alrighty. So that's my eggs. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna break the yolk and give it a little whip up. Just so that it incorporates into the flour mixture a bit nicer. Just a little bit. Even though I am a scientist, I'm not a very scientific baker. It's kind of what works at the time, what I feel like. It'll go wrong one week and right the next, but I'll learn from that. So bring back your dry ingredients and then you want to add your oil, which was one tablespoon. Um, you can use vegetable oil, canola oil, something that's quite plain. About that. Um, and then the milk, which is three quarter cups. I've slowly been destroying each of my cups as I've used them so much, the handles have slowly snapped off. So I'm left with either a half a cup or a third of a cup. <laughs> so <laughs> again, science of baking. <laughs> so that's my half a cup. That's my tiddly bit left in that bottle of milk. But here's one I bought earlier. <laughs> And when you've got oily hands, to so try and take the top off a bottle of milk. All right, we are winning. Okay, so about half of this will be about a quarter. So that's my three quarters of a cup of milk, and then my and then my eggs. Nice, nice, yummy. Yolky bits at the bottom. I'm gonna put the lid on the milk because I'm bound to spill it. Um, and I'm just going to, before I whisk it, I'm just gonna give it a little mix round because I don't really want to be flying flour all over my kitchen as much as I do that often. Um, just going to start to mix it in. And we wanna mix it and make everything really well incorporated so that there's no there's no flour lumpy bits left over. So I've just stirred that in a little bit. I dread to think what the likes of Paul Hollywood and all of those think of my bread making and my, <laughs> and my habits. As long as it has a good bake, you can win. Exactly, as long as it's edible. Right, I'm just gonna do this on a really low speed. Um, but I'm just going to whisk it up very slowly and make sure everything is well incorporated. Obviously don't put your fingers in the whisk and whisk. Ready. That looks pretty good. If you have fancy things like dough hooks and that sort of thing, I'm sure they'd be very useful at this point. So get all your nice doughy mixture out very sticky and tacky which is good you yeah. don't want limp flat 
very nice. I have unplugged this, so it's not gonna trap my fingers. Get out of the way. Okay. I'm just gonna whisk around a little bit more just with my hand. Make sure. All good. Can you see that? Oh, it's going off the screen. Sorry about that. And it will start to, everything kind of starts to come together and starts pulling away from the bowl so that it's not tacky on the bowl anymore. A uh, question was very professional looking. Can you use almond milk? Uh, I've not tried it, um, but I don't see why not. I guess it's just it's just a wet ingredient. Um, so I guess as long as you use the same quantities, give it a go. If it works, that's good. Um, yeah, I can't can't really see see why not really. Um, all right, and I don't want to be mixing that in the bowl anymore. So what I'm going to do is get my bag of flour, my nice gluten-free flour. Uh, and this is just the way I like to do it, but I'm sure everybody has their own way of flouring a surface. Um, I like to just put a little bit down the side and then I can brush in what I need as and when I need it and if I need a little bit more. Okay, so you can see how nice and stretchy my dough is. I'm gonna get as much out as I can. Very much flour my hands up and get some of the stickiness off. This is the fun part, the messier the better. Gotta, gotta have a bit of fun with baking. Um, I just find that putting a bit of flour on my hands and rubbing them together just makes the, the wet dough that's on my hands dry and then it rubs off really easily. And then I just feel like I've got clean hands again to start working with my dough. Not necessary, but that's what I like to do. Okay, now I'm gonna cover my hands in flour Put a bit more over the dough, put it in the middle of the screen so everyone can actually see it. Give dough a nice clap, it's just doing a good job. Um, I guess you don't want to add too much flour into your dough, but you want to be able to work with it. Um, you do want it to be wet. And now that it's dry enough, good job dough. Um, I'm just gonna work it a little bit not too much. Just so that it's like nice and smooth and doughy and... Question on whether or not you weigh the liquids? Do I weigh the liquids? Um, you can do, I think it's about 50 grams of egg um, and then the egg white. I'm not sure how much the egg white should weigh but I think it's about 50 grams of egg. Um, the and then the milk is measured so um, 177 ml of milk and oh what was the other one what other liquid and the oil is about 14 grams something like that um, okay so I've got my nice dough you'd have no idea this was gluten free Ooh. Um, which is the aim here Chloe Chloe, can yeah. you stick your finger in the top of it so I can see what the rebound is? It's kind of wet. Okay. There's not really, there's not really rebound because there's not, um, whilst the, the xanthan gum is going to give it some elasticity, but it's not like a gluten elasticity. Okay. Where when, when, you prove, you. when you prove it, it comes like all puffy and stretchy and it doesn't really do that in this bread. Okay. Um, so the recipe actually says use a sharp knife to cut it. Um, 
but I'm just going to break it with my hands. And I'm sure there's a reason why you cut it, but I'm just going to break it. So you want to break your dough up into eight pieces because we're making eight um, pizza breads. So I like to just go in halves and halves and halves until I get the right amount. Um, if it's getting a bit sticky, it's okay. You, you can weigh it. I did weigh it last time to know how much each thing was. Um, but I just put my bowl on the scale, zero it, weigh it, divide it by eight. Um, but this is good too. It means if you have a slightly bigger one, you can have it on a slightly hungrier day, <laughs> is my motto. <laughs> um, alrighty, I'm all sticky again, which is good because I want my dough to be sticky. And my oven is heated up now too. Um, I don't know who's following along as we go and who's not, but um, my oven is ready to go. Made a little pile of blobby dough over here. My husband actually really likes the taste of raw dough. So this is his little pile of goodies for later. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, that's his reward for going to get me some eggs. Um, so this is quite sticky, so I'm just going to dust a little flour on top, line them up in a row like good soldiers. Um, okay. Now I'm going to get a sheet of baking paper because um, they're all going to be baked on there. Um, you can get your pan out the oven now if you want to and put your baking paper on, but your, ba your pan needs to be really hot. Um, so I've got that there ready. And what we want to do is pick up our dough blob, just give it a little roll, give it a little pat. You just want to make them into like round-ish kind of shapes um, and get your rolling pin. Once you get to that stage, Bit of flour on your rolling pin. That's something I always remember my nanny doing when I was younger, watching her cook. She's going like this with the rolling pin. That's always a memory I have whenever I think of, whenever I do that, I think of my nanny doing it. Um, but saying that, it was actually my granddad who taught me to bake, not my nanny. Right, so about a quarter of an inch whatever that is in, in metric. Um, do the same, so blob, roll, pack, sticky, flour, pack, roll, sticky. Some turn out better than others. That one might get re-rolled later. <laughs> Roll your dough blob, cut your dough blob, bit of flour, roll it out. I like to move it around quite a lot and I think that I used to do a lot of um, cake making, like I said before my glutenism, um, and I used to make a lot of decorated cakes and things like that with the icing and all of that over the top. Um, and you'd roll out this huge great piece of icing, go to put it over a cake and realize the entire thing was stuck to the bottom. So moving things around a lot, flipping them over, I learned very quickly from doing all of that. Um, I hope to get back to some gluten-free baking one day. Um, using decorated cakes, I've got a lot of, a lot of love for that. Okay, roly roly. Is anybody following along as we do it out of interest? Um, Bubba says, have you tried rolling them between the sheets of baking paper? And nobody has answered that they're baking along. Okay, okay. That sounds like a genius idea, Bob. I might try that next time. I can't 
kind of like, oh. <laughs> so that's what happens if it gets stuck. I try not to like roll them and handle them too much. Um, but sometimes you just can't help it. And maybe that will be the one that doesn't rise properly. But, you know. we go. We're getting there. So we're what, one, two, three, four, five down. One's a skinny little one. Yeah. So when I, um, when I did this with normal flour, uh, rather than gluten free flour, what I did was the 35 grams of tapioca starch. I substituted for an extra 35 grams of, um, flour, uh, which is what you can also do if you don't have tapioca starch that you're still using gluten-free flour um, and I just did the recipe exactly the same it's it's a bit stickier so I used a lot more um, a lot more flour at this stage which I think is probably not a good idea because you don't want to over flour saying that I'm very aware there's a huge pile of flour there that's okay um, and yeah they turned out fine they just didn't puff up in the same way that the, the gluten-free ones did. Um, but the flowers behave very differently. So when I say it's gluten-free flour, what it actually is, is a blend of things. Um, so there's no true substitute for flour um, that doesn't have gluten in it. So you usually, when you buy a gluten-free flour, it will be a blend of a whole load of different flours that have been ground from, um, rice flour or tapioca flour or potato starch or that kind of thing so every single i would have confidence before that if i went to the shops and i bought a normal flour it would behave the same if i bought a different brand of the same flour or it would behave largely the same whereas if i do that with gluten-free flours you can get different results because the different types of flours um have different purposes so so with the tapioca starch, that gives you a crisper crust. So if you're doing something that you don't want a crisper crust, you don't want a blend that contains tapioca. You might want something, something else. Or rice flour makes things a little bit more gritty. So you don't want that if you're making something that's really light and fluffy. Um, so that it's, it's quite interesting to see the different types of things that are out there. Um, so these are my lovely pita breads rolled out into very obscure, very different shapes. Um, and the next stage now is to put them in the oven. Um, so the process for this, um, I'm gonna put my parchment onto my baking tray. I'm gonna put it out there and put it on. And then I'm only gonna bake about two at a time. Um, I will move the camera so you can see me doing this. Um, but what you wanna do is bake them for two minutes as quickly as you can, pull them out the oven, flip them over, put them back in, bake them for another one minute, pull them out, flip them over, put them back in, and then bake them for about another two minutes. So it's two, one, two. But last time I did these, I kind of just um, watched them and decided when it was best around about those times. So the two minutes I stuck to that, the one minute in the middle on the other side, I kind of waited until they looked like they were kind of goldeny on that side. So I think it was more one and a half minutes, two minutes. And then I flipped them over on the other side until they looked really nice and done and as puffed up as I think they would, they would get. So if anyone's watched the um, Great British Bake Off where the people are sitting on the floor in front of their ovens just watching things bake, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to wash my hands first though because they look a bit like this. <laughs> and uh, I'll leave you to admire my very obscure pit of shapes. I think that's part of the fun of it. So I'm just going to bring you down. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to put you in the cupboard so that you can. See my other. Okay, okay. 
So it's on uh, 200 degrees Celsius, that is. Um, my, my hot pan and my matching. So you pop your baking sheet in. Yeah, I'm going to pop the first one on there and a slightly fatter one. Okay, and I think this is a bit of trial and error. See what works with your oven. My back right of the oven is really the hottest part of my oven. Um, I'm going to set a timer for two minutes and I'm going to sit and watch them and hope that they puff up. Let me see, so I'm not very good at remembering what time I set them going, I get very distracted. Um, so we're at 40, 2.40. And if anybody wants to ask questions, you can feel free to unmute and ask. Now is the time. <laughs> now is the time, yep. Chloe, when you've made them and they've cooled down, do you have to eat them that day you make them or can you keep them? Um, I think it's more, you've got to try not to eat them all in one go because they're really delicious. Um, <laughs> no, you can, you can keep them. So typically um, things made gluten-free don't last as long as um, their non-gluten-free things. Um, so you do need to eat them quicker or half the recipe. And it's such a quick recipe to make, you could make it... Um, twice in a week if, if you wanted to but mine last time kept for about a week um well about a working week so about five days um and i haven't tried freezing them um but i expect they'd be fine to freeze but you wouldn't get as good a texture from them like with anything when you freeze it in the fridge or in the cupboard uh, i kept mine in the cupboard in an air, airtight container. Thank you. No worries. Um, so I made uh, last week, I, or whenever I made these last, uh, I made some um, uh, baked falafel. Uh, I think usually falafels are deep fried or fried or something. Um, but I, I made some baked ones, um, which is just mushed up chickpeas with seasonings like cumin and, and that sort of thing. Onion, garlic, lots of garlic. We like garlic in our house. Um, 2.42. Aha! Thank you, <laughs> Alrighty. Hold that thought. Okay. Ooh. Okay, so, I'm glad someone's keeping time. Um, so you can kind of see they're popping up already. But give them a flick over as quick as you can without them flying out the other. And that's another one minute, Sean, if you're... Uh... <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so they're kind of... I, I might be able to show you... Oh, in... um... oh, now you can just see how dirty my oven is. Okay, I did clean this the other week. Um, but you can see things are starting to puff up. A nice little puff here. Um, yeah, so now what I'm looking for is I want them to puff up nice, um, but they're really going to do the majority of their puffing up um, the others when I flip them over again. Um, but this side isn't going to get any more cooking, so I do want it to be nice and kind of goldeny browny colour. Um, once it's on this side and you won't you don't get as much of a pitter pocket as the ones you buy in the shops um and that's to do with the elasticity and the rise and that sort of thing um but About a minute chloe i'll give it a little bit more thanks sean um but you can leave them for a couple of minutes when they come out the oven you can eat them straight away uh, but a couple of minutes to cool down, um, cut a slice through the middle, and then you can coax a whole 
um, sometimes there's a big enough hole and sometimes you just need to like open and um, Baba would like to know if you can cook them in a pan on the stove. Ooh, um, I have no idea. Well, that leads me to wonder is I have a cast iron piece that I can put over my burners. Oh, yeah. Um, I've, and it's got a flat side and a ridge side. I wonder if I could do it on the ridge side or if it needs to be surrounded by the heat. I think probably like breads, um, it needs to be surrounded by that heat to help them puff up, but I don't know. That would be interesting to try um, and let me know how you go. I will not be doing that next week. I don't have any idea what I'm going to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we're puffing up quite nicely. Um, that one, on, you, you, wouldn't have, you might not have seen that, but this one on the left hand side is just puffed up and gone. So it's uh, puffed up really nicely and well. an air pocket that's, that's dispersed. So that's a good sign. Um, so two minutes again on this side. So it's two, about one and a half, two. Flip them over. But just be careful when you're pulling things out that, you know, it's, everything is very hot. Um, but yeah, so, so I made some uh, falafel balls and they went, um, they were really nice inside. Um, some tzatziki dip, which is um, a combination of plain yogurt, Greek yogurt. I just use whatever unflavored yogurt I've got in the fridge. Um, some cucumber that's grated and squeezed all the juice out so that you've just got the, the grated bits. Some mint, um, which I actually managed to get from my garden this week. Uh, my mint plant, wasn't looking very healthy a couple of weeks ago but I managed to get enough mint for for the tzatziki um, and a bit of lemon juice um, but again I ran out of lemon so I used orange juice um, freshly squeezed and that worked just as well really I guess it's just a citrus juice but uh, yeah that comes back to my whatever I've got in the cupboard I'll chuck in and see see what works. Garlic? Garlic, yeah, that's I forgot that one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we're browning browning slightly. Um, I've got ten seconds left on this timer, but I'll just see how they're going. Um, There we go. I don't really like to open the oven halfway through, a bit like a Yorkshire pudding. You don't want to let any heat out. Um, I'll leave them in for a couple more seconds. Also glasses issues with doing that, <laughs> which I'm sure a lot of people have. Um, Chloe, do you eat yeah. them hot when you've kept them or do you warm them up? Um, I, I've done it both. Um, so I, could, I heat them up under the grill, just mm. for, I don't know, I just put it on medium and put them in there for a couple of minutes or so on each side. And what helps as well, which is my mum's trick, um, is just to sprinkle a little bit of water on both sides before you re-grill them. Um, and then that helps to keep the moisture in them and stops them drying out when you grill them. Uh, but I've also had them cold um, and they're just as good. What Adam's been doing actually with the ones I tried out last week without gluten-free flour um, is to, I'm gonna leave you on a cliffhanger there. Yeah, they're looking quite good. So I'm just gonna get them out. Um, yeah, what Adam did was, uh, because they were more of a flatbread, um, he, he just put some passata on it, um, and then put some peppers and some pineapple, depending on how you feel about pineapple and pizzas, and some cheese on top and just grilled that and had it as like a mini pizza for lunch. Oh, that bread, so that's, that's a good way to use them as well. Um, okay, I've just got these out of the oven. Actually, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna re-suspend you up here. Oh, I won't cook all of these, obviously. Um, will 
So these are very hot. Uh, these are what they look like out the oven. Can you see those? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Is that better? Okay. Um, yep, these are what they look like out of the oven. Um, could, could have perhaps done with a little more browning maybe. Um, but I think they're, they're looking a pretty nice golden colour. They've got a little bit of dusting of flour on the outside. Um, and if I can find a knife somewhere. Um, so moment of truth, if we have any uh, pockets on the inside. Oh, oh look at we that. So we have some little pockets on the inside. Um, oh, cool. That's excellent. So this one, okay, so this one was a little bit thicker. Um, the, the dough. Um, so this one I rolled much flatter and that's given me the pocket. This one I've rolled much thicker and this one's not got the pocket. Uh, but it's probably got a bit of a pocket down here somewhere. Um, but yeah, so they are my very free printer breads and they taste pretty good. Lovely. Yeah. And 